President of India, Chancellor of the Indian Institute of Space, Science and Technology, and Ambassador Barry Desker, Dean of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce His Excellency, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam from India. Dr. Kalam served as the 11th President of India from July 2002 until July 2007. Prior to that, he had served as a principal scientific advisor to the government of, Indone of India as a cabinet minister from 1999 to 2001. Dr. Kalam uh, is an outstanding scientist. He has made great contributions to Indian defense research, space research, and atomic energy development. In fact, he is known as the father of the Indian nuclear bomb. Dr. Kalam has also made uh, tremendous contributions uh, to the fields of science and engineering and more broadly to the development of, in, of education in India. Since his uh, stepping down, he has spent increasingly more time pondering important civilizational issues affecting humankind. We are therefore very pleased that President Kalam could join us today and to deliver the world leader keynote address. His uh, talk is entitled, The Confluence of Civilizations, Peace and Pros uh, Prosperity of Societies. May I now welcome uh, His Excellency, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam. Please, Dr. Kalam. Uh, friends, good afternoon not for all of you. I hope you enjoy your food. I also enjoyed my food. <laughs> uh, for, first of all, I would like to greet my honorable friend, His Excellency, President Esar Nathan, and Ambassador Barry Desco, and all of you friends who have assembled here from various parts of the country and, in, and also within Singapore. Uh, friends, before I have made a text for you to talk to. Before that, I thought, after hearing some of the discussion you had in this forum, I thought of telling you uh, some few thoughts It struck me today morning. Number one, you know, I have some two experiences, India and multi-nation cooperation. That is, uh, my analysis indicates if you can bring the core competence of multinations and this is going to benefit a number of nations economically and culturally. For example, I started up when I addressed the Pan African Parliament with the 53 nation Johannesburg when I was a president. I propose an idea, Pan-African Pan E-Network. That Pan-African E-Network uh, concerns the India offered that based on the core competence of Africa and the India's core competence, we will invest about $150 million about to connect 53 nations in telemedicine, teleeducation, and e-governance. And in about four years' time, nearly 40 countries have been connected. No, this small amount of $150 million and the technology core competence of the nation can benefit 53 nations apart from India itself. If the amount spent and the core competence of the nation is used, uh, this I find this is what is needed today. Instead of we are in desperate economic problems, every nation has got a core competence. If we bring the core competence of multiple bilaterally, or multiple nations, 
uh, we can achieve a lot economically. The another area I, I personally I involved, what is called a collaboration uh, between Russia and India. Uh, we, instead, we invested about $150 million each, total cost of the program $300 million. This is building, building a unique system the world has not seen. And uh, it, uh, $300 million, at that time we did not know what we are heading, only two scientists, myself from one in India and my, co my friend in Russia. We know each other's core competence in the labor scientific, scientific laboratories. We brought together core competence, and fortunately both our governments uh, saw the investment is, is a good one. So we invested $300 million. Today, that is a business of $10 billion. Core competence of the two nations, it has become to $10 billion. It's a small amount, looks like. But I find nationally, internationally, we have unique core competence. We need a unique type of leaders. What we need today, the leadership, the type of leadership what we need, leader of magnanimity. That means you have to accept the magnanimity of a, magnanimity, magnanimity, magnanimity is essential to accept there is a core competence exists for a nation and use your nation core competence, make a product system and to be useful multiple nations. This is one quality is very important I observed. Friends, with this introduction, I am indeed delighted to address and to interact with the participants at the second Singapore Global Dialogue hosted by the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies uh, here in Singapore. My greetings to the organizers, uh, policymakers, academicians, social workers, and students and present here. When I am here with all of you, let me share some thoughts on the subject, confluence of civilizations, uh, leading to prosperity and peace of the societies. Friends, past experience of multiple civilizations have shown that the peace has been eluding the world of nations. While time and again, world statesmen have talked about peace of the world, a viable mechanism for avoidance of war or fear of war has not been it has not been in sight. It has been a great effort of the leaders to have conceived for all like United, United Nations. But the question is, it's my personal opinion, not government opinion, but the question is whether they are effective enough. One issue may be that financial. It is contribution of a large economic powers is required for the survival of United Nations. Hence, many times, Causes supported or silence observed may not be in the best interest of humanity as a whole. Another phenomena we have been witnessing has been that civilizational growth is perceived as a function of war and war industry. Even the opinion makers and the analysis of international strategic thinking change their ways of thinking to suit the native policies of economically powerful nations because of international trade, de trade dependence. While in principle, democracy of a nation is propagated, it is not clear how much democratic opinions of nations are valued internationally, yet another dimension prevalent throughout the world, be, be it developed or developing, there are big divides within the nation on education, healthcare, water, energy, and other aspects. Such divides cause a ripples and could turn out to be a potential conflict situation that, that can go out of control. The recent trend is wherever oil fields are there, it is becoming a liability for oil nations, particularly in Middle East, uh, for the recent high oil dependence of certain nations. With this, all these situations, the positive side of the event is that in the meanwhile, technology has greatly enabled globalization of the world and presents hitherto 
unexplored opportunities for nations simultaneously working on a regional cooperation. Let me now look at today's global environment. The present global environment indicates that we need new and out-of-box solutions. What is the global dynamics of the present time? Today, the challenges of the world are poverty, illiteracy, a safe drinking water, a clean and green energy, equitable distribution of resources, quality education with values for all, societal imbalances, diseases, quality health care for all, and good living condition with employment potential. Individual nations are working together to find a solution to these challenges. However, we are clearly witnessing the challenge faced by nations are not only of their making or the solution amenable only by the individual nation. There are many international dimensions for the cause and solutions. Hence, working for solution is a collective responsibility of a global community. Also, when nations start working on the common enemies of illiteracy, poor health care, their tendency to focus on war business may come down with better uh, mutual trust. Let us look at the dynamics of the manifestation of the global challenges. The world today is integrally connected through four rapid connectivities. They are environment, people, economy, and ideas. We all know that global warming and climate change are no longer problem of individual nations, but they are planetary problem. In the present time, a single product may be made out of components sourced from multiple continents and provide services to markets far off from their place of origin. We also saw and witnessing how the economic turbulence originating in one part of the globe affecting many nations in trade and business, how a volcanic corruption in an island nation brought the entire airline industry to a halt. The world today is concerned about the recessions, growing inflationary pressures, potential fall in growth rates, affecting valuable efforts on development and lifestyle of many nations. Advances in transportation have progressively made movement of people across the nation and region more feasible. This has led to the globalization of skills and talents which can flow seamlessly from one nation to another. This also has led to the globalization of the human diseases, the most recent incident being of different kinds of flu, which rapidly spread across the globe and threaten their lives. Similarly, ideas and innovation are no longer geographically or politically confined. An invention made today somewhere takes no time to find its market thousands of miles away. The expansion of information and communication technology and the convergence of technological tools are structuring a new world knowledge where problems of one part of the world can be solved by multiple experts based on different points of globe. Seamless flow of information and people also means that local or regional issues will invariably gain global prominence and unaddressed problems and poverty can mutate rapidly into global terrorism, which we are at already witnessing. The flow of ideas has also led to the increasing importance of global human rights and propagation of the ideas of democracy. Let me recall an experience. When I was traveling in an aircraft abroad, to USA, 15 hours non-stop flight from Delhi to New York. I was, my, the, the captain asked me to spend some time with him in his, uh, in his control room. I was told, cockpit, I was told that much of its controls were software driven and most probably developed in India, the fly-by-wire. When I presented my credit card, I was told that it was being processed in the backend server located in Mauritius. When I walked into a multinational software company in Bangalore, India, I was fascinated to find that it truly presented a multicultural environment. A software developer from China, working under a project leader from South Korea, working with a software engineer from India, and a hardware architect from the US, and the communication expert from Germany, 
were all working together to solve the banking problem in Australia. I have seen how Singapore professionals uh, keep it as a business hub connecting East and West. When I see all of them working together, like one family forgetting about the culture from which they came or the language they speak, I feel that the only hope for such borderless interaction to continue is to inculcate the spirit of borderlessness in every field of human activities in the planet Earth. Hence, friends, it is beyond doubt that we are progressively evolving a world where our problems would, not, would, would cut across the boundaries and would be multi-pronged. This implies the solution to this problem would have to be integrated with the knowledge of multiple nations and skills of multiple societies. With this background, I would like to dwell further into an implementation strategies and challenges in achieving the people empowered states in a global democratic environment with efficiency. I have been working on the subject as of global level participation in solving problem of applicable to the entire world with my students and research scholars at the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad, India, Indian Institute of Management Indore, and Gatton College Business and Economics, Lexington, USA. With these students and scholars, I have been exchanging the thought process with many professionals in different parts of the world. I have evolved with my students and researchers. I have evolved a world vision 2030 for prosperity with peace for the entire world. I am very happy to share and discuss this vision in this important meet at RSIS Singapore. Of course, world vision needs further research inputs and thought from multiple societies, including RSIS. Let us see the global world system for prosperity and peace, world vision, I call it World Vision 2030. I visualize the distinct profile for the nation of the world in 2030, uh, which will be a great enabler for, for a new global order system for prosperity and peace. What are they? Number one, a world of nation where the divide between rural and urban, rich and the poor, developed and developing has narrowed down. Next one, the world of nation where there's an equitable distribution and adequate access to energy and quality water. A world where core competence of each nation, a world where core competition of each nation identified missions synergizing the core competence of the different nation lead to the economic advantage and foster development for all the societies. A world of nation where all the students of the societies are imparted education with value system. A world of nation where affordable quality health care is available to all. A world of nation where the governance is responsive, transparent and corruption free. A world of nation where crime against women and children are absent and none in the society feels alienated. A world of nation where is able to give a clean, green environment to all its citizens. A world of nation that is a world that is prosperous, healthy, secure, devoid of terrorism, peaceful, happy, and continues with a sustainable growth path. A finally, the world of nation with creative leadership who ensure effective mechanism to resolve conflicts between nation and societies in a timely manner, keeping overall peace prosperity of the world as a goal. Friend, this is the kind of the world which you have yet to give to the youth of the world. As I see the thinkers from various dimensions in front of me, I can see each one of you contributing to one of the development pillars I focused or other aspects of the World Vision 2030. Now, Yahashia has a significant role in the realization of this global vision what I projected. Let me elaborate. Asia is a global human resource cadre. Asia represents 60% of the human population of the world. With a nation like India, who have youth potential, Asia's population has the opportunity to be the skilled force of the world. For example, in August 2010, the economist in an article that named the Himalaya of Hiring uh, reported that 2016, four out of every 10 new global workers will be from India. China is already regarded as the manufacturing hub for the world. 
it is believed that India would, it, India would create 50 million highly skilled personnel to be generated every year for the next decade. That's the need of the hour is to empower the Asian youth with the global skills leading to the formation of a global human resource cadre. Global human resource cadre. This will require Asian universities and industries to come together and create, create the necessary infrastructure and knowledge base for skill dissemination, skill certification, and skill, skill upgradation. The next area, Asian promotion. Asian Asian Pura Mission. Asia has 30% of the land area and a significant rural population. Moreover, with 3.8 billion people in the continent, Asia has to depend on its farms for feeding its population. This will require innovation in agriculture science and a focused mission on rural development. Let me suggest a sustainable rural development system which can be applied to the entire continent of Asia. It is called Pura, providing urban amenities in the rural areas. Pura envisages provision of physical connectivity, electronic connectivity, and knowledge connectivity, leading to economic connectivity of the clusters of villages in different parts of the region. Based on the terrain and climatic condition, we will have hill Pura, plain Pura, coastal Pura, and desert Pura. The total number of Pura in India alone will be around 7,000. The Indian government, various state governments, NGOs, and private organizations are already working on the mission of implementing such Puras for rural development in India. I'm sure the lessons of Pura implementation in India would be relevant for application of the sustainable rural development mission across the continent of Asia and elsewhere. For example, when I visited Philippines, I suggested that the model of island-based Puras and in Maldives, I put forward the vision of atoll level Pura. Asia, Asia has potential to be an economic powerhouse. In the present situation of a turbulent world economy, Asia's role in the global economic equation is imperative. Nations like China, Japan, South Korea, and India and Singapore are among the leading economies of the world. China and India are amongst the fastest growing economies whose GDP growth was relatively unaffected by even the global recession in 2008 and even now. Singapore and Hong Kong represent the regions where many of the world's financial and manufacturing companies have bases. Moreover, Asia with its increasing prosperity will represent a large fraction of a demand and consumption in times to come. Thus, now with the maturing economics in Asia, it is time to consider economical organization with full participation from the member nation of the Asian continent. This would require initiative on, easy, on easier trade, fair policy, on currency exchange, sustainable business model, peaceful cooperation, and shared growth and responsibilities. Is it possible? There's a dream similar to European Union of Nations and the European Parliament, which I addressed, Asian Union of the Nation and Parliament. The audience should remember, I am talking about the growth and prosperity and peace of 3.8 billion people. Also, I believe as 21st century unfolds, the people of the Asia will give rising importance to higher economic growth, peace, and prosperity instead of involving themselves in political and regional conflicts. Now, the third point I want to convey, energy independence in Asia. Energy independence in Asia. Asia is, a, is also center of the world's energy supply. Living in a time of crucial dependence of fossil fuel, the Middle East nation with their petroleum reserves are the energy stations of the world. Nations like China and India, too, despite their limited petroleum resources, have made significant investment in the energy sector for energy independence. However, the need of the hour is now for Asia to take leadership in the upgradation of energy supply from fossil to green fuel. Asian nations are already among the top emitters of greenhouse gases, and as we progress, it's important the 60% of the population of the world does not take the historic path of the environment degradation being the cost of economic growth. So we need supply side as well as demand side management. Thus, Asia needs to collectively embark on a mission of energy independence, which is 
sufficing the demand of energy from completely green belt. It would require collaborative ventures in solar, wind, and nuclear power. One of the key areas would be research and development of the thorium power sector. Thorium fuel reactors are much safer than uranium powered ones. Use far less nuclear material, one metric ton of thorium gets as much as energy as 200 metric tons of uranium and 3.5 million tons of 3.5 million metric tons of coal produce waste and that is toxic for a shorter period of time. 300 years versus uranium is tens of thousands of years and is hard to weaponize. In fact, thorium can even feed off toxic plutonium waste to produce energy. And because the biggest cost in nuclear power is safety and thorium reactors cannot melt down, they will be eventually be much cheaper too. Therefore, it is essential to pursue the development of the nuclear power using thorium reserves of which are high in many nations including India. All Asian countries with their scientific capacities and their presence of large reserve thorium can work together for thorium-based power plant to the world. Another area for realizing unlimited amount of clean energy is that space-based solar power. I have recently, uh, I have recently this system, the solar, space solar power system with the National Space Development Council of USA and China's Environment and Energy Summit, I addressed them in Beijing. Solar power satellite will not only power Asia, but the whole world. Friends, space-based solar power has many advantages over the traditional terrestrial-based solar plants. First, the level of solar irradiation is about 1.4 times in the extraterrestrial level than at the surface of the Earth. Second, in case of surface-based solar power plant, the panels can collect solar power for about six to eight hours only. Uh, whereas in the case of space-based solar power, the collection time is 24 hours. Also, the space-based solar power plants are not affected by weather conditions, which may bring down the efficiency in case of terrestrial power plant. Thus, space-based solar power, which I am advocating, would be far more effective in their efficiency and power generation than the land-based system. There are three major focus areas in the space-based solar power plant. First component is the space-based solar power plant. Second is the earth-based collection system. And the third, third important aspect is the medium of transmission from space to earth. The aspect of safety and efficiency has to be paramount in, in the energy transmitted uh, space back to earth either through microwave or any other technology like laser technology. One way to increase the safety and improve the efficiency could be the evolution of nano energy packs, nano energy, which I am advocating, nano energy packs which are reusable and can move like a small batteries carrying charge back and forth from space solar station to ground reception. Another important factor is the cost of the space-based power plant, which given the current launch technologies would be very high and needs to be brought down. Among the largest cost component of installing a space-based solar power plant will be launching cost of the component. The current estimate ranges billions of dollars for an average plant size. There is a need to bring down this cost. The long-term cost of space solar power plant for the period of 20 years of operation has been brought down to under, uh, under small cost per kilowatt to make it economically sustainable. Can we do this? It has to come through a multi-pronged approach where Asian nation, Asian researchers and Asian universities can take the lead. Friends, Asia towards confluence of civilization. Asia represents the cradle of human civilization with ancient civilization like the Indus Valley, Mesopotamia, and Chinese, all the major religions of the world can trace their origin in the continent of Asia. For long, humanity has been obsessed with the differences in faith and civilizations. Uh, for long, it has been a cause of conflict and disturbed peace. Now we need to work on the meeting place of all the civilization and religions, and also harness the unique philosophies which are good for humankind as a whole. None other than Asia, is the best place to embark on such a mission in this crisis-ridden world. In essence, we have to build brick by brick unity in diversity. Singapore has been a great hub in business and commerce. It could also be a great hub 
for evolving unity in diversity with its multilingual, multi-religious heritage. This will eventually lead to generation of where prosperity with peace is promised through a confluence of civilization. It will be an example for all other nations to follow. In conclusion, friends, so far I have discussed about the global vision, its component, how Asia is vital in the mission to realize them. I had touched upon the civilizational heritage of the continent. I wish to share some more ideas on the same. Righteousness in the heart of the human being leads to perfect life. Righteousness in the heart of the human being leads to a perfect life of an enlightened citizen. When I visit divine places in India and also Temple of Confucius in Taiwan, I realize how righteousness in the heart is propagated as our civilization strength. Let me recite a hymn, Evolved Righteous in the Heart. It goes like this. Where there is righteousness in the heart, there is beauty in the character. Where there is a beauty in the character, there is harmony in the home. Where there is harmony in the home, there is order in the nation. Where there is order in the nation, there is peace in the world. Friends, as you said, as you said, as, as, friends, as said by Confucius, 2,500 years ago, from the emperor down to the common man, the cultivation of the righteousness of li righteous life is the foundation for all, he said. Hence, what the nation, the world need are the combination of Global Vision 2030 and righteousness in the heart of every citizen for realizing a green, clean environment without pollution, having prosperity without poverty, peace without fear of war, and a happy place to live for all citizens of the nations of the world. With these words, I convey my best wishes to all the participants of Singapore Global Dialogue Success in their mission of realizing societal peace and prosperity through confluence of civilization. May God bless you all, friends. Thank you very much, uh, President Kalam. Uh, in his address, uh, President Kalam uh, spoke of the confluence of civilizations, uh, how we are approaching uh, peace and prosperity of societies. I think underlying the argument made uh, by President Kalam uh, is the issue of human security, which goes beyond military security or the security of states to the security of people within that state uh, and their well-being over the long uh, term. Uh, I would like now to open the floor uh, for questions. We have limited time, so could you please put your questions succinctly. The first question, please. Yes, yes please. General Yao. General. Thank you very much for a very good presentation, keynote address. Uh, Your Excellency, my question is about nuclear weapons. You have been crucial to make India a nuclear weapon state, state, de facto nuclear weapon state. And then, right now, there are a very a sweeping movement of the world toward a nuclear free world, nuclear weapon free world. So, do you think it's in, in, uh, possible to achieve for the mankind ever to have a nuclear weapon free world? And if so, what's the Indians, what, what Indians should do to contribute to the process? Thank you. It's a beautiful question. Uh, I would like to, two points I would like to uh, suggest. One is India as a nuclear weapon state. Uh, we had a nuclear doctrine, we have got a nuclear doctrine. That doctrine, the principal point is no first use. No first use. That's a principal point. Uh, second one is we are total nuclear disarmament. Uh, India, uh, you want to be a partner in the total nuclear disarmament mission. Uh, third is, we want, we appreciate any collaboration between the nations, what is happening. For example, recently, uh, US president and uh, Russian president, they met. They are, both of them have got, happily have got 10,000 nuclear warheads. They said they are going to reduce. 
in number of years time they will reduce to one third uh, so it's a good movement one day i visualize i visualize that uh, instead of uh, uh, spending money in the nuclear weapon area all of us should spend money putting a solar power satellite uh, radiating the clean energy from space down to our earth nations okay next question please Yes, please. Uh, Ron Matthews. Your Excellency, um, thank you very much for a most interesting talk. Um, I've spent some time in India, and uh, it's struck me that when I was there a few years back, this was during the period prior to 1992, when liberalization started to take root, there was an environment characterized by state intervention, industrial licensing, planning. And it was a claustrophobic economy. And in your talk today, one of the themes was technology development. And I'd like to know your view on the positioning of India today in terms of if you're going to be a mega power rather than just a great power, the emphasis ought to be on domestic technological development capability rather than dependence on other nations. As the heritage of state planning uh, stultified your technological dynamism in India, or are we on the verge of a great breakthrough? Thank you. Well, sir, it's a very interesting question. Makes me to think. Uh, you know, any growing nation, we are a developing nation. We we want to by another nine years time, by 2020, uh, economically developed nation. That is by removing the people below poverty line, 300 million people. That's a real mission. Now, of course, your technology is the main tool. Technology is going to be the main tool in agriculture, in the information technology, in the infrastructure, and critical technologies, and education, healthcare. But we are aware that technology in future uh, cannot be developed uh, exclusively for one nation. And it has to be, multi for example, there's a new technological systems coming in, what is called a convergence of technologies. That means bioscience, biotechnology, uh, information technology, nanotechnology. It comes in a big way for health science going to make a big change. So here, uh, I am advocating with multinational cooperation, certain area in life science area of uh, development, uh, nation to nation cooperate. Uh, I told you, you know, in the beginning of the introduction, how India and uh, Russia uh, with uh, technologically we cooperating, investing $300 billion, we led to $10 billion. Imagine the same idea come into commercial area, how many nations will benefit? We spent a small amount uh, for, uh, uh, for Pan-African E-Network, 53 nations getting benefited. So what I believe, however, we need a, a leadership for uh, a new type of leadership. Win-win situation. Leader, do you think I will? I, I have got something knowledge. I have got something technology. Let me uh, cooperate with my neighbor. He has got another technology or a system. Let us cooperate together. That is, I call le leader of magnanimity. We need this world needs leader of magnanimity, not warlike mind, not war business. We need leader of magnanimity in thinking, in action. Yes, could we take both those questions together, please? Oh. Uh, good afternoon, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Anselm Chu from Global Youth Congress, Singapore. Uh, I have, do have <laughs> two questions. Yes, sir. First question is relating to uh, Ambassador Kish, uh, Kisho Mabugani's uh, talk this morning. He mentioned about United Nations uh, Security Council uh, lacking in the 
in the presence or representation from Asia powers. So what do you think, uh, how long more will UN or the Western powers accept uh, Asian powers like India and Japan to be a permanent member in the Security Council? The other one is linked to India's uh, rise. Um, recently we read a newspaper report from Straits Times about increased uh, naval presence uh, of India uh, warships in South China Sea. Do you think India, in the perspective, will play a more active role in the regional uh, situation? Thank you. Sir, my feeling is, I have indicated in my presentation, uh, United Nations and the UN Security Council, it should represent 7 billion people of the world. You cannot represent half the population or quarter of the population. It should represent 7 billion of people. That is our, our population, world population. Now, naturally, that the India, has, uh, we believe, if you are Security Council, we can contribute in a big way. And um, it cannot be avoided. According to me, it's only a question of time. India and many other nations should get a place in the Security Council. Regarding China and India, you know, we are one of the largest partner, China and India. We do a business of $50 billion with them. Now it's growing. The Chinese uh, India is growing the business and trade. Now, you know, each one has to walk in his own or in her shadow. And uh, China has got a civilization strength and India has got a civilization strength. But we meet, as Chawanlai said, and not Chola, as, uh, as Confucius said, and Lord Buddha said, righteousness in the heart will lead to the beauty in the character, that leads to harmony in the home, that leads to peace in the world. So it looks to me, finally we have to work for India, China, of any other nation, prosperity and peace of the world. That's what I have proposed, what's called 2030 vision, world vision, is peace and prosperity of the world, not only India and China. We want to see, just like you saw, how a small money, the Pan-African E-Network is, uh, is came out. How small money between two nations brought a business proposals like uh, uh, India, India, Russia. So this is what we should do. I, my future way of thinking should be, strategy should be, what can I do for my people? What can I do for the world? That type of thing a world leader should think in terms of what I can do for the world. Instead of, instead of saying, what can I take? We should think in terms of, what can I give to the world? That is the real leadership. That is the real leadership of magnanimity. The final question over there, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Yusmadi Yusuf. I'm from Malaysia, member of parliament. On confluence of civilizations, uh, I'm for what um, Excellency say about collaborative entrepreneurship, so to speak. But being a young leader here, I would like to ask your suggestion. Because for me, I'm struggling to really understand Mahabharata, and even to understand Sango Yang Yi. And I have to say, with full of humility, I will never touch China if I cannot understand Sango Yang Yi or the Three Kingdom. I will never touch India if I, will, I cannot understand Mahabharata. But at the same time, you mentioned unity in diversity, which I know, as a matter of fact, is a very, uh, I would say, effective principle all this while practiced in uh, Indonesia. With all this strength in this region, can you suggest, I mean, taking the points of to have a righteous of heart, uh, leadership of magnanimity, can you suggest something for someone like me or many more young leaders in this region? Thank you very much. Yeah, I... I have met so far uh, 12 million young people below 25 years, last 10 years, 12 million people. One of the questions they ask me is how I can be a unique person? How I can be? Unique person. Now, when I study religion, I have studied all religions. There are two components in every religion. One is theology. Another spirituality. Now theology is very special for every religion, you can't touch it. If you touch it, you had it. 
So, but spirituality, if you go deep into the every religious uh, sacred uh, documents, you find it's common. Almost all the religion says that always you think in terms of what can I give. That is the spirituality. So I am advocating why not we connect the spirituality component of the religion and get a bridge, get a, get a, a bridge to really the religion, that society and then civilization. That's my uh, push. You can ask me, is it possible at all? Is it possible to connect the religions? I give you an example. Somewhere southern part of India, there's a place called Tumba. Tumba, there was a, my guru, my teacher was Vikram Sarabhai. He wanted to establish a space research center there because the equatorial region, the equator is passing through near, nearest the area. So he wanted about 400 acres of the land. That land, uh, government said, we won't give because there's a church, Catholic church is there. There's a bishop house there, and there are thousands, thousands of fishing community studying there. We can't give. Now, my guru, he is a very man of steadfastness. He said, you give me solution, how do I get that land? They gave other type of land. Then he said, only one person can help you, that is Reverend Father Peter Perira. Reverend Father Peter Perira, Prasada, Satya, Vikram Sarabhai, my professor, met him told him we need land for scientific research. And Reverend Father said, Bishop said, Oh, you, Vikram, you are asking me my home, Bishop House. You are asking me my God's home. And you ask me my people's home, thousands. How can I give? But both of them, both Professor Vikram Sarabhai and Reverend Father Peter Perira, they had commonality between them. They can smile at difficult time. They smiled. Next day, he was invited to the church, and he went to the church, Vikram Sarabhai went to the church, and uh, Professor, uh, the B Bishop Reverend Father Peter Perira introduced Vikram, here is a scientist, what science do? Science helps people materially, it gives a telephone, it gives the mic, it gives the health care, it gives some prosperity, and agriculture productivity increases. And what pre preacher like me does, that is a bishop, what he does, he gives peace to the people peace to the people. So science and spirituality, religion, have to meet together. Can you give this a land of 400 acres for scientific purpose? There was a pint of silence. Then all of them, thousands of people, they got up, they said, Amen. The church was given. The bishop house was given. The whole place was given for scientific work. But here we see the two great minds of uh, two religious minds, your spiritual and scientific mind, they work together. It is possible to connect the societies. And this is the type of message we should collect nationally, internationally, spread the message, connect the civilization and societies. Thank you, President Kalam. President Kalam demonstrated today that he straddles uh, the pillars of scienti scientists and technologists as well as that of a humanist. Uh, he has given us a thought-provoking address, and could I ask you to join me in thanking President Kala? Thank you, Your Excellency, Dr. Kalam and Ambassador Barry Desker.